Hello, and welcome to the first discussion series of Buddha Nights. I am Monira Hashimi, playwright, actor, and director. In 2005, I co-founded Simor Film Association of Culture and Art in Herat, west of Afghanistan. March 11, 2013, I co-founded A Night with Buddha Festival to commemorate the destruction of world cultural heritage, the Buddha statues of Bamiyan. The destruction of Buddha statues in 2001, which carried out in the continuation of decades of ethnic cleansing with the aim of destroying the history of Hazara people, was beyond massacre. It was a cultural genocide. 20 years later after the destruction, even the remains, the empty niche of Buddha statues, are again in danger in Bamiyan. This year, we at Theatre Deuce, with collaboration of Safe Heaven, Freedom Talks, arrange a series of discussion to understand the different aspects of destruction of cultural heritage, destroying history, forced forgetting, social discrimination, and genocide against Hazara people. Unfortunately, we miss one of our guests, Sajjad Askari, and I hope that we can have him with us in the next session. But today with us, uh, we have Dr. Humaira Rezaei. She is the Executive Operation Lead at Mirzim and the Chair of the Hazara Committee in the UK. Dr. Humaira advocates for the rights of Hazaras in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Through her work, she has written several reports and parliamentary briefs on the Hazaras, providing accurate information on what is really happening on the ground. Omeira was one of the organizers who co-led the hashtag Stop Hazara Genocide campaign, which has increased the conversation on the persecution of Hazaras in Afghanistan. This hashtag was trained many times, including yesterday in Twitter. This session, which will be moderated by Asad Buddha. Asad Buddha is a freelance writer he studied sociology and Islamic theology, and he has worked as researcher and university lecturer in Kabul. He is the former icon guest writer in Karlstad. Det återvändande ågat, a chapter of his personal memoir, was published in Varmland Writers Anthology. He has worked with Rick's Theater and Theater Deuce on a project called Little History, resulting in publishing a book under the title of Hoppets Territorium. Southern Stars and Homo Soccer och Foglarna på Linje Gatan are his last published texts in Ord och Bild and Govet Brevster Art Gallery. He is also involved in visual art, focusing on the demonization of political enemies and aesthetic aspect of extremist and religious violence. Thank you, dear Homera, for being with us. And now I leave the platform for you and Asad. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Munira, and welcome and Freedom Talks Theater Deuce and Safe Haven. And thank you, Humaira, for joining us into this meeting. Unfortunately, we missed Sajjat Askari. Uh, I hope he can join us during the meeting. So the title we are going to talk today is uh, Unjust Narrative. Uh, and the absence of uh, Hazara people in, in the public discussion. So, uh, and the idea is uh, the discrimination, the social discrimination has language aspect and it's come from the order of speech. And so first the discrimination started from a kind of narrative and then implemented into the people. So if we go back to the uh, little background of this topic for Hazara people. So uh, it uh, started usually at the end of uh, uh, 19th century. So it, it was the first time that the Hazara people classified. So as a Hazara, as, uh, so they reduced to the Shia uh, because Hazara are uh, Shia, Sunni, Ismaili. So they are come from different religion. But at the first time, at the end of uh, 19th century, during the Abdurrahman time, Hazara people categorized and classified 
uh, and reduce to Shia. So, uh, and then so create a kind of uh, uh, symbol to humiliate the Hazara people and to, to justify the discrimination. Uh, they dehumanized Hazara. If you go back to the history during the Abdul Rahman time, so when they are talking about the Hazara people, they are talking uh, as a Yari people, as a rebel, as an infidel people. So, and then based off this discussion, uh, so he, uh, on that time, the Abdurrahman government created a narrative uh, to justify the killing of Hazara people and pluralize the society. And, and then, after it's, it's led to a very biggest genocide between uh, uh, 1892 and 1893, uh, 62% of Hazara people has been killed and 64% um, uh, of uh, Hazara people land occupied and they, they missed their land, they first displaced and then so this discrimination continue, but what's happened after genocide? So, and then this the biggest genocide in the uh, uh, human history denied by government and by uh, other people who committed the genocide. So, uh, so now we are going to talk about how this kind of narrative influenced the Hazara people and how it's a kind of injustice in unjust narrative, it influenced even Hazara people life in today. So uh, two days uh, ago happened the one of dangerous suicide attack in, in Kabul, uh, in Dashti Barshi, but there is no discussion about that. So th there is no media to cover that. So we are invited guests to, to talk about this topic. I'm welcoming Humaira. Uh, thank you so much, Asad. Um, thank you for the organizing parties for this very timely and very important conversation they were having, especially what's happened uh, this week, uh, this targeted attacks against the Hazaras. Um, as you rightly said, uh, the unjust narrative is something not only led to the genocide of Hazaras, but actually led to the continuation of this genocide, uh, discrimination and oppression and as we can see that evidence, especially the increase of violence that we see uh, against the Hazara community under the Taliban regime. And I think most often we undermine the power of unjust narrative um, because you know, the unjust narrative not only is within the perpetrators uh, community, but also it infiltrates uh, into, in this case, the Hazara community. And a lot of times you mentioned that the Hazaras were um, divided and categorized as, as, as Shias and, and, and Shiism is used to justify their killing. And unfortunately, this narrative has infiltrated even the Hazara community in which they believe that the reason they're getting killed is because of, uh, of their religious sect. We, we often forget that the campaign that the state of Afghanistan back in the 1700s um, had against the Hazaras uh, was, was a lot of this. And I think it wasn't successful until when they said that Hazaras are Shias and Shias are infidels. And therefore, if you commit just um, jihad against uh, the Hazaras then as, or against the Shias, then it's, it's all right. And they allowed that. And this was something that led not only to uh, not only the um, soldiers at that time, the trained soldiers who went on to fight against the Hazaras, but also normal people because of this narrative to say that Hazaras are infidels, Hazaras are, Hazaras are kafir, that led to normal people, normal civilians taking up arms and fighting against the Hazaras. Yeah, so if we go back a little, so uh, at the end of uh, 19th century, the Afghanistan divided in three spaces. Uh, one is the uh, uh, Darul Islam, uh, which was the, the territory of uh, Amir Abdurrahman control. Uh, and, and the other was the Darul Ahd, the territory of contract, those who collaborate with Abdurrahman 
And the, the third one was the treaty of infidels or Darul Kufr, which was defined, the Hazara people uh, defined as infidel as treaty of infidels. So, and, and then on that time, the Hazara people reduced to the Shia to mobilize uh, the other people to create a kind of uh, religious discussion and it's uh, uh, continue uh, years and years, more than uh, one century. So still, when we think about that, do you think is it a change in this narrative or is still uh, we are uh, at the same unjust narrative? in Afghanistan about Hazara people? Um, unfortunately, we're still on the same unjust narrative, um, you know, and, and this narrative back in the days in the 1800s, they used uh, religious scholars to be able to portray this kind of messages. But with the advancement in technology now, they are using social media, they're using madrasas, and to be able to continue with this unjust narrative, to be able to continue with these propagandas against the Hazaras, um, to, so they can justify the killing of the Hazaras uh, in Afghanistan and Pakistan. And, and, and there has, of course, there has been many other ways in which this unjust narrative have been able to continue. And one of the, uh, I guess, very effective uh, ways that they've done that is through academics and historians. They've used their writers They've uh, in their uh, history books, for example, they have uh, the way in which they describe the Hazaras is absolutely wrong. And this is done even to this day. Um, the way that they describe Hazaras, the way that they de 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 dehumanize Hazaras in their books is why the continuation of these genocide um, is happening. Uh, yeah, so, so uh, the hate driving ways to the Hazara people uh, still continuing very strongly. So, uh, so uh, 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 today also we have the same categorization for Hazara people, the same label. So if, if we go, for example, into the um, Afghan narratives, uh, so uh, categorizing uh, Hazara as Afghan is also unjust because uh, it is established in uh, 1942. So before it was Hazara and uh, Pashtun people and uh, Tajik and other ethnicities. And then, so the Afghan uh, imposed to Hazara people and other uh, ethnicity in Afghanistan. So, and also when, when they are talking about uh, Hazara people, they are demonized them, they uh, dehumanize them. As a person, you as a person who, who engage a lot with uh, Hazara issues, so how we can find this kind of narratives or this kind of image of Hazara nationally and internationally? Um, yeah, absolutely right. Um, I think the, the word Afghan is very interchangeable with Pashtun, right? And uh, uh, and 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 this identity was was forced on the entire population of Afghanistan, but it is more painful for the Hazaras because this is the identity of the perpetrators, the identity of the people who uh, committed genocide against the Hazaras, who killed and uh, sixty two percent of the Hazaras massacred people, who enslaved the Hazaras for. Um, decades and continued the persecution of Hazaras. And now we have to go with that identity. We have to call ourselves Afghan. If not, then you are a traitor to the uh, national unity. And, and, and all of this, again, is, you know, this is one thing that, for example, in the past 20 years, it's the fact that many Hazaras then want to be identified by their own identity as a Hazara, which of course every human being has the right to do that. Um, the, there was a huge campaign against the Hazaras that they are traitors to Afghanistan because they don't want to be called Afghan, right? This itself is a narrative that was used against the Hazaras. Um, and, I, and, and of course for the Hazaras, especially in the past 20 years, we've seen how different they are um, to the rest of the Afghan population. Um, and if you want to look back, I think it's important to give a little bit of context here is that if you, for example, look back at how Hazaras used to live before the genocide, it is very different to how it is now. And there's a specific book that I usually reference is Captain John Woods, 
in which a book that he published in the uh, 1960s, he described the Hazaras very, very different to how they are now. Um, one of the things that he said was that gender equality was very much present within the Hazara society. He was saying that there are no difference between men and women in the Hazara society, and that women are no shy of strangers, right? And, and of course, that is something that you don't see in the modern day um, Afghanistan, because even within the Hazara community, because the colonization and this uh, oppression and, and, and this genocide has led the entire Hazara society to completely change and uh, during that time and after that time to adapt into this new culture, this new colonized way of living. And, and now when we look at the um, Afghanistan, we don't see gender equality, whereas 20 years before the Hazara genocide, we saw gender equality within the Hazara society. Um, and, and now if you want to look at back in, in, in the past 20 years, we have seen Hazaras, how they have gone back into those values that we've promoted education, we've promoted um, uh, liberty. Hazaras are one of the most progressive uh, ethnic group in Afghanistan. We prioritize education, we promote human rights, women's rights, and we have social liberal values in which the extremist people in Afghanistan, these values are something that they stand against. And that is another factor in which we are being targeted um, in Afghanistan and makes us the most marginalized community there. And, and I think you know, there is another aspect that I'd also to like to touch on, and I think we might be able to discuss this a little further, is the use of Hazara women to demonize and dehumanize the Hazaras. And, and if we look, if we, for example, speak to a lot of women who worked in Afghanistan in the past 20 years, you speak to them, the one thing they say is that the Hazara women are considered as loose, loose women, right? And this is the image that they have given the Hazara woman, which, puts a Hazara woman which in, in a much higher risk of sexual violence, sexual harassment, being discriminated against in work, not only in uh, private sector, but also in government positions. And this is something that we unfortunately uh, see. And, and you asked earlier, you asked the question whether it has changed, and unfortunately it hasn't. It may have even gone worse because now that you see a lot of women, Hazara women in society and taking up positions, um, it has led to more uh, discrimination against the Hazaras because in a very conservative society in Afghanistan, the men doesn't believe the woman uh, to have this position and Hazara women spearheaded this change, spearheaded the civil development in Afghanistan and it's something that puts Hazaras even at more risk of, um, of persecution in Afghanistan because these are the values in which, for example, Taliban stand against. Um, and so, yeah. So, uh... Uh, when this unjust narrative created, so uh, Amir Abdul Rahman used uh, the the word of Roy Halini Hoi. It is the exact translation of final solution, which Naz used for Jewish people. So and then they created this kind of uh, unjust narrative uh, to justify the killing of Hazara people. So do you think uh, in, in today? Uh, for example, when they are uh, developing the hate speech against the Hazara people uh, and, and use the same terms to, for example, uh, to, to Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, and uh, Hazara to Goristan. So uh, is, it, uh, is it this same objective in today also for this kind of narrative? Oh, oh, absolutely. I think, uh, you know, the, the people back in the 90s when they, the slogan that they used to shout, um, Tajiks, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Uzbekistan, Hazaras to Goristan, which means graveyards. And also there were, uh, this, the other slogan was that Hazaras either convert to Sunnis or they die. So there was no other option for Hazaras. And even today with the current Taliban regime, one thing that we see is the use of extremist Sunni ideology being implemented in Afghanistan, right? And they are saying that if you don't identify yourself as a Sunni Afghan, then you don't belong in Afghanistan. And this is the type of language that they use uh, in Afghanistan. And of course, Hazaras, one majority of the Hazaras are not 
um, Sunni extremist. Um, most of us, we don't identify ourselves as Afghan because we're Hazaras. And that is something that, of course, that doesn't in sync with their um, ideology, with their narrative. And it just puts us in a huge risk. And, and this is very, very similar to what we saw back in the 1890s when Amir Abdurrahman Khan gave the final um, solution for all the Hazaras, and, and which has led to 62% of the Hazaras being massacred. Um, and, and unfortunately, this is something that the international community have failed to recognize. And this is something that even in the past 20 years when the international community community were present in Afghanistan is something that they did not uh, recognize, something that they did not work on, something that's one of the biggest mistakes of the international community was that they only dealt with the dominant group in Afghanistan, which are majority Pashtuns. And of course, we all know that the, the way in which the Pashtuns have always treated the Hazaras were, well, of course, is very evident. But of course, the other thing that happened in Afghanistan in the past 130 years is the suffering of Hazara people were always hidden, right? The way in which the international community, even in the past 130 years, saw the Hazaras was from the very narrow narrative of Pashtuns. And Pashtun, of course, are the perpetrators who committed the genocide, of committing a genocide right now and the oppressions and persecution of Hazaras. And so even with the presence of the international community in Afghanistan, the way in which the international or the rest of the world viewed the Hazaras was through this very narrative, um, uh, very narrow narrative of Pashtuns. Um, and, and even today, that's the same. We don't see any uh, Hazara representation in um, international dialogue, international conversation, in media, or in the governments. And, and of course, even in, in the past 20 years, a lot of Hazaras that did occupy um, some of the positions, especially within the government, were mainly a symbolic with no real power. And there is a, um, a, a report that was published by the US State Department in 2017 um, that actually looks into the situation of Hazaras in Afghanistan. And they do um, say that there are things such as extortion, uh, forced labor, which is a sign of slavery in Afghanistan within the Hazara community um, still exists. And they also uh, reiterate that um, a lot of position within the governments that are occupied by the Hazaras are uh, mainly symbolic with no real power within Afghanistan. So even the people who worked within the government with no real power were not able to be able to represent the Hazaras when they had no voice and no real power to be able to implement any changes. And therefore this narrative or the way in which the Hazara people were portrayed to the international community was again through this very narrow uh, and, and very controlled um, narrative of the dominant group in Afghanistan. When I was a student, so I had research about forms of narratives in Afghanistan. So I, uh, I read al uh, almost more maybe uh, 1000 document and research about that. So, uh, so I, I, I couldn't find anything about Hazar people. So they, they mostly from uh, dominant perspective or from uh, minorities perspective. But there is also something about Hazara. There is some short report about Hazara people, but in this report, they, they tried in the narrative, so they demonized the Hazara people and, and tried to draw as a kind of negative aspect of society. Uh, so, when, uh, or negative aspect of uh, narrative. So, they, they, so in today, when we when we go to the social media, when we maybe uh, if we go back before Taliban to uh, this twenty year, which international community come to Afghanistan, so the narrative was the same. So the Afghan government classified Dash Barchi as a kind of dangerous area, which was not really because Dashti Barchi and west of Kabul was the only place for young uh, people in Afghanistan who uh, they go there to read poem, to have uh, literature activity, uh, art activity. And uh, it was a very democratic space uh, in compare of uh, other. So how we, uh, how we follow this uh, in different form of narrative. Is it this kind of narrative influence uh, the international narrative also? 
for example, do the, uh, is it possible that, for example, international media or researcher from other countries uh, to see to the Hazara people from other perspective? Um, again, um, uh, when you know going again going back 130 years especially 20 years like I said because the international community were dealing with the dominant group in Afghanistan as you said they were portraying the Hazaras as a specific image um, and they had specific control narrative about the Hazaras um, example you gave was that the Barshi was class classified as a dangerous place where in fact it was the most peaceful place uh, with no con internal conflict within the community where people are the most progressive people. They produce the highest um, educated um, students with the highest number of uh, students being able to attend University of Scholars, right? They have the, the best schools uh, in, in, in Kabul is in Dashti Barchi in west of Kabul district. Um, and, and these are the narrative in which the international community, including journalists, have access to. Right. Um, yes, the use of social media in the past 20 years has been a huge, huge factor in these narratives that the international community have of the Hazaras. But another thing that, of course, in the field of academic, that uh, a lot of academic international academics have access to and they know about the Hazaras is through the academic books in which Pashtuns publish in Afghanistan. We also have to remember that Hazaras weren't allowed to be published any books for a very long time. Um, and in which that the even any uh, historians that published books about Hazaras were also very, very controlled by the Afghan state. And there's, for example, Hassan Kokar, which is an Afghan historian, um, still to this day publishes book. In one of his book, he, um, of course, in most of his book, he, there's a lot of lies about Hazaras and there's a lot of ways in which he was, in, in this, through these lies, he's able to demonize and dehumanize Hazaras. And there's one specific example in which that has been to this day, very shocking to me personally, because I'm from um, Johori and, and, and in his book, he describes their specific ceremony in Johori that is called Kubast ceremony in which the Hazara, uh, uh, in, he claims that Hazara men are offer their women to guests in this, uh, in this district. And of course, I'm from there. I have been living there for three generations. And this is something that is completely untrue and lie. Uh, and to say something like this um, and, 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 and uh, uh, relate this type of information to an extremist and conservative society, it is the most demonizing thing you can do to say that uh, there is a society in Afghanistan, there's a community in Afghanistan that uh, offers their woman to their guests, right? And, and this is on academic level. This is the level of dehumanization that happens on academic level in which then the international scholars, um, scholars from around the world will then read this book and would think it's true, right? And more importantly, this book is then um, uh, distributed within the uh, communities in Afghanistan. And this is the sort of image that they will have of Jawri when it's completely untrue. Um, again, because I, um, I've been from there for three generations. And another lie that he says in his book is that the reason why there are some um, variety in Hazara features, uh, Hazaras who have bigger eyes or bigger nose is because um, those women have slept with Pashtun or Tajik men. Um, again, another lie and something that if you are, again, this is something that then justifies the sexual violence against the Hazara woman uh, in Afghanistan, because it's something that they can then justify and say, oh, you're used to it because this is how, what you do and this is how you are, right? And so if this is an academic level, the narrative and the image and the propaganda in which they portray not only to the Hazar, uh, to the um, Afghan society, but also to the international level. So imagine that the, 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 the negative aspect of it, imagine the um, uh, influence they will have on people's minds. And of course, if you go back to social media, they have utilized social media very, very effectively in the way in which they are able to uh, portray the Hazaras in certain image to say how they are such, for example, yourself saying that um, Dashti Barchi is a dangerous place not to go. Uh, for example, another um, narrative that they pushed in which the international community believed was that when um, Alipur in Behzud took up arms and he wanted to defend 
the Hazara people in Afghanistan from Kuchis and Taliban. He was an anti-Taliban. He was resistant against the Taliban. The Afghan government then labeled him as a terrorist um, just so they can take, uh, dismantle his arm and, and uh, leave Hazaras completely armless and defenseless against the Taliban. And so again, this, the, the fact that the Afghan state for 130 years had access and control uh, in, in which the certain information can be relayed and portrayed to the international community has had a huge role in which um, the Hazara community, how Hazara community were portrayed, uh, not only within the uh, Afghan society, but also in, uh, uh, in the international community. Um, again, uh, the Taliban are using, utilizing social media as well um, to portray um, their narrative against the Hazaras um, to the international community. And of course, the fact that the international community fails to uh, engage with the Hazaras also is a factor in which this effectiveness of these narratives uh, being implemented in people's minds um, uh, yeah, plays a huge role. Uh, thank you. One aspect of uh, this unjust narrative is to limit Hazara religiously to Shia uh, and also to limit, limit the Hazara geographically in the center of Afghanistan. So, so the aims of this narrative is to reduce Hazara to religiously to Shia and to the center of Afghanistan. But Hazara people are a huge, uh, uh, a big society so, uh, with uh, different religions and, uh, and in different parts of Afghanistan in uh, Badakhshan, Takhar, uh, Badakhis, uh, Hazarajat, and, and also the historical base was in in, in Maidani Wardak, it was in Nangarhar, so it's best of uh, uh, historical document. So today, I think it's uh, the, the same narrative is uh, continue to reduce uh, the Hazara people in the Shia people uh, and, uh, and ignore the, and also to reduce the Hazara people geographically in, uh, in, uh, in the center of Afghanistan. So how we, for example, uh, how we maybe demajoritize this kind of narrative uh, and from which kind of perspective we, we can create a kind of justice narrative? Um, yeah, I, absolutely right. I think one of the other um, aspect that of these um, minoritizing Hazaras we saw was when uh, Rani, um, regarding the ID card, then he reduced uh, or um, divided the Hazara ethnic group in different, in at least 11 different sub-ethnic groups within the Hazaras. And the fact that there is no real census has been done in Afghanistan is a way to be able to control um, this. Because if they're able to, uh, to conduct an actual census and be able to get accurate information on the population of Afghanistan, they will see that the, the Hazaras are not the 9% that they claim to be. Hazaras are estimated to be at least 30 to 35% of Afghanistan's population. And the fact that they are portraying or they are have they have this narrative that Hazara is a minority group is is in a way subconsciously is trying to um, take this power away from the Hazara community because if you're telling if you continue keep telling people that you're only a minority you're a small percentage in Afghanistan you you start to believe that you actually have no power and one of the reason in which they have um, actively stopped census being conducted in Afghanistan is so they are able to ensure that Hazaras will never be able to gain the confidence and the power to be able to defend themselves. And the reason in which they divided the Hazaras into the ethnic Hazaras into sub-ethnic groups, again, is part of this division to be able to then categorize the Hazaras as um, Sheikh Ali, if, even though Sheikh Ali are Hazaras, they, um, after this division, they um, published a statement to say that they are not um, a, a specific ethnic group, they are Hazaras from Sheikh Ali. Sheikh Ali is not, uh, is, is not an ethnic group, it's a name of place, right? So they have gone to that extent to be able to, uh, to ensure that Hazaras are seen as a minority, is to be able to control um, the number of 
uh, Hazaras, uh, to be able to minoritize Hazaras in Afghanistan. And I think one of the ways that, that we can try and, and, and um, at least uh, start a just narrative is to ensure that Hazaras are present in dialogues and conversations in all aspects, in all policies within different governments, um, is for the Hazaras to engage um, the governments uh, in these policies. Um, I think it's been a little bit way too long for the Hazaras to go unnoticed and their sufferings to go unnoticed, right? Um, if they're able to kill um, hundreds of people within days, um, 250 Hazaras died just within three days in, in different attacks in Mazar Sharif. And out of these 126 were school children. Um, and these are all acts of genocide in Afghanistan. And I think this is the time that the Hazaras themselves are able to engage with the government, engage with the international community, to be able to relay actual information of what is happening in the ground, actual information of who the Hazaras are. Um, we have helped, we supported the international community and their presence in Afghanistan in the past 20 years. You don't see a single shot being fired in, against the international community from a Hazara populated area. We supported their value, democracy value. We were the ones who gave up our arms and we said, we are with you and we supported them. And therefore it is their duty to be able to engage with the Hazaras, to be able to listen to Hazaras, to be able not to um, go and, and, and notice of their sufferings, to be able to recognize the Hazaras as a vulnerable, and, and vulnerable group in Afghanistan, is to recognize the Hazara genocide in 1890s, 1990s, and to recognize that there's ongoing genocide against the Hazaras in Afghanistan. And another way that I think is, is incredibly important is through media and social media. And of course, in the past um, two days, we've had the social media campaign, Stop Hazara Genocide. And this, you know, we saw actual changes being brought uh, in this when we saw certain politicians who firstly denied um, that this was a targeted attack against the Hazaras and after engaging with them, talking with them uh, and raising awareness about the situation, then they, of course, were then educated and they realized that actually this is not just a target or a, an attack attack on education, but actually this was a target against the Hazari community. And I think raising awareness, being able to engage in different dialogues at different levels is incredibly important for the Hazaras to, to be able to, um, to change this narrative. The demonization or the dehumanization of Hazara people is very, very powerful narrative, even the school children and the Hazara students, they demonize. So we uh, remember that during the uh, Ashraf Ghani and uh, Hamid Karzai government means, uh, uh, the, the student of Hazara people demonized and they tried even to, to find a way that to create some obstacles uh, and don't allow them to, to go to the university and, and then uh, uh, they started, uh, so we experienced, Hazar people experienced a huge uh, uh, suicide attack in their educational uh, center uh, in, in Afghanistan. So if we, if we think about genocide as a kind of uh, circumstance, as a kind of situation which, which comes from unjust narrative, uh, what do you think, uh, is it, uh, are we in the same circumstance or uh, is this situation is a, a genocide situation uh, or not? Uh, it is a genocide situation. Um, and of course the unjust narrative has allowed this uh, genocide to continue, um, like crime against humanity to continue, this atrocity to continue against the Hazaras. Um, you mentioned that dehumanization of of Hazara students. During the Ghani uh, government, he put a quota on the number of students from Hazaras that can attend um, universities because he saw that the, num the majority of, uh, of students, for example, in Kabul University were Hazaras and he didn't like that. He then put a quota on the number of students to limit uh, the number of Hazara students are able to access higher education. Um, and I think to this day, it, it is, um, sorry, I, I forgot your question. Uh, the question is, uh, if we think about uh, genocide as a kind of situation, 
uh, a process that create a kind of genocide situation. So it's, uh, of course, it's come from a kind of narrative. So first it, it should be started from a kind of uh, justification and creating a kind of uh, unjust narrative. Do you think the question is, uh, uh, are we still in this circumstance of uh, genocide or, or the, is the Hazara situation is a genocide situation? So, and if it is a genocide situation and uh, how we can advocate in, for Hazara people uh, nationally and internationally. I, I'm, so what, what is the best way to maybe to stay against this kind of uh, genocide process? Um, yeah, it is, it is a genocide taking place in Afghanistan. If we look at the definition of genocide by, um, uh, uh, you know, it, it does fall under genocide. It is a target against the community for their ethnic uh, identity. Um, the, to be able to have a just narrative, to be able to portray the actual information, to be able to portray um, and relay true information of the situation of Hazars in Afghanistan, I think uh, the international community can play a huge role, right? So one of the reason in which the suffering of Hazaras um, went unnoticed uh, up until 2001, for example, is because there was a, a huge control over how Hazaras were able to interact with the international community. Today, we have a large Hazara diaspora around the world who are scholars, researchers, um, ex expertise in different fields, especially human rights law, who have access to the international community. And of course, the international community, it is their responsibility um, to be able to prevent or to stop this ongoing genocide against the Hazaras. And, and I can't emphasize enough on the international community having a conversation with the Hazaras themselves, right? The, when the attack against the Abdurrahim Shahid school happened, the international community, international media went on to say this was an attack against education. They did not recognize that this was an attack against the Hazaras. This is the first step is to ensure that who recognize these systematic attacks are against the Hazaras is a clear evidence of genocide in Afghanistan. They then went on to speak with perpetrators who are anti-Hazaras from news uh, interviews to the politicians and people who have real power, then going and speaking with the actual perpetrators in Afghanistan, with the dominant group, was then to say con their condolences to this, those people who committed the crimes, the people who had a huge role into the continuation and the oppression of Hazaras in Afghanistan, right? This is, it's for me, it's absolutely unbelievable for them to, for these people with real powers who have access to the entire Hazara diaspora community was to sit down, whether it's the politician, whether it's the news anchors, whether it's the media, to sit down with perpetrators to then talk about these attacks. It's absolutely disgusting and it should, sh it's not acceptable at all, right? It is real damaging for them not to be able to have the Hazara voices in these platforms. It is incredibly important to ensure that Hazara experience and Hazara voices are represented in all platforms um, they, when they talk about issues regarding Afghanistan because Hazaras have specific problems in Afghanistan. We have specific narratives. We have specific experience that if they allowed the Hazaras to sit in these platforms to ensure that they are able to raise their voice, we would be able to reduce these atrocities um, a lot quicker and, and much more. And yeah. So, yeah, so you mean uh, still Hazara people are the target killing and they are still in the situation of genocide and the unjust narrative is uh, continuing very strongly, mm, yeah. Um, absolutely. I think when we look at some of the um, uh, press releases, statements that was published um, about the attack against the, say, uh, the Abdurrahim Shahid school or the attack in Mazar-e-Sharif, 
um, this week and from UN to Human Rights Watch uh, to many other governments where when we read their statement, when we read their uh, press releases, we don't see a single mention of the Hazaras, right? And the fact that they don't recognize these, um, that these are systematic against, against the Hazaras is one of the main factors for the continuation of this genocide. And I think the only organization which I saw that they deliberately mentioned the Hazaras was Amnesty International. And I think it's Human Rights Watch, UN's responsibility to recognize that this is systematic attack against the Hazaras. I mean, the UN, when they first published their, their press release, they said that there's, um, in, in these the attacks in Kabul, during the three attacks in Kabul, they said that there was only six dead and 11 injured. When in fact, we know the number of dead has reached as much as 126, right? And this is the same narrative in which the Pashtuns um, uh, portrayed. And they, this is the exact figures that Pashtun had given um, to their press release to say that the number of um, casualties in these attacks was six uh, dead and, and 11 injured. And so we can clearly see that the international community, especially the UN, Human Rights Watch, um, are not conversing with the Hazaras. They're not recognizing that this, that these are systematic attacks, or at least they're not uh, publicly stating that these are systematic attacks against the Hazaras. And the moment you then hide that, and the moment you censor the identity of the Hazaras, it empowers the perpetrators to continue to commit their atrocities against the Hazaras because they know it is going unnoticed. They know that, oh, they see it as just a violence in Afghanistan, an attack against education, an attack against mosques, when it's clearly an attack against the Hazara, so the Hazara themselves. So uh, they never recognize uh, Hazara as a, as a kind of uh, target of genocide. So the genocide of Hazara people never recognize and it's always refused and so they, they, they want to clean the evidence and not accept that uh, they are living in this situation. If I summarize this discussion, so the unjust narrative in Afghanistan started from uh, end of 19th century with the biggest genocide of uh, Hazara people. 62 percentages of Hazara people has been killed. Uh, between uh, 1892 uh, and 1893. Uh, and this kind of uh, discrimination continue in, in the form of unjust narrative or unjust narrative uh, in, in, in different level uh, during the Afghan history. So Afghan history in itself is a kind of unjust narrative because it's uh, reduced the identity of the, the multi-identity of Af people who are living in Afghanistan into one tribe, uh, in, into Pashtun people. So, and, and then this kind of unjust, uh, unjust narrative had a very, has, has a very different negative aspect and influence the life of uh, people, uh, especially uh, the Hazara people. So you now when we talk about uh, Hazara people at the national level, so there is not talking about them. So it's uh, it's just Afghan history. If there is talking, they are just dehumanized and demonized and draw as a negative aspect of uh, Afghan history. And it's also influenced very deeply the international narrative also because they are the official uh, resource for researcher, for journalists, for uh, those people who are working uh, about Afghanistan. So it's uh, we, we can see this kind of unjust narrative in BBC and uh, very clearly in, in Radio Azadi, in, in Afghan uh, national media uh, very uh, clearly and also in uh, ISKOL uh, textbook in Afghanistan. So there is no talking about Hazara people. Uh, and also in, uh, uh, in, in universities text also. So it has a huge, and this kind of unjust narrative uh, create a kind of situation that Hazara people become 
they target killing uh, in a situation of genocide and uh, and and never recognized what's happened to them. So still, those people who has the control of narrative, so they are uh, refusing the Hazara genocide. Do you have something uh, to add, Humaira? Uh, uh, thank you, thank you, Asad. Um, yes, uh, the, the last point I wanted to add is the importance of monitoring and documenting this situation, these the atrocities been committed and these attacks that have been committed against the Hazaras. Uh, the Human Rights Watch, uh, Human Rights Organization, um, they have a responsibility to document and report on these atrocities, especially with the takeover of Afghanistan, the collapse of the civil society, the uh, lack of uh, freedom of expression, the fact that um, the journalists are not allowed to report on any of these incidents. I think the international community has a responsibility to be able to uh, monitor the situation of Hazaras in Afghanistan to document uh, and report on these atrocities being committed. And I think it's time that they recognize the genocide uh, of Hazaras uh, in 1890s, 1990s, and to recognize that the ongoing Hazara genocide is happening right now. Um, and the last point I wanted to add is that there is an Hazara inquiry which has been launched by British parliamentarians at the moment where we are looking um, into the situation of Hazaras in Afghanistan. And one of the main aim of this inquiry is to engage the UK government as well as the international actors on what they can do to safeguard the Hazaras uh, in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, and also, um, the last message that I have is that the Hazara genocide is still taking place in the shadow of the unjust narrative on a national and international level. And I believe that Freedom Talks provide this opportunity to see Afghanistan from the perspective of the people who are subject to genocide for more than one century. So I do, from the bottom of my heart, really thank you for everyone, um, uh, individual as well as the organizing party uh, for this really wonderful and important um, program that you have organized. So uh, I think it's time to we think about uh, alternative narrative, uh, because if we want to stay against genocide, we first we need a kind of narrative, uh, a multi-perspective narrative, focus on diversity, uh, and to uh, to accept in, in uh, different uh, different people uh, in in this society. Thank you very much, uh, Humaira, for joining us into this meeting. Uh, unfortunately, we missed Sajjad Askari. Uh, so I hope we, we can have a discussion uh, with him uh, maybe in the future. Thank you for uh, Theater Dus, uh, Freedom Talk, and Safe Heaven. And thank you for uh, Munira Hoshmi. Uh, with, for very Unira Hashmi for very good introduction. So I hope that uh, we as a diaspora uh, the, find a connection with the, the country where we live in uh, to create a kind of alternative narrative and to stay, uh, uh, stay against the unjust narrative. Thank you very much, Hamira. Thank you.